When did you last time change your mind? Not on something minor, but on a deeper belief. Did you ever shake your head over a belief that you've had in the past? Say that the moon is made out of cheese, or that the market can solve all problems of society. Can you still remember what it felt like when you saw the world with completely different eyes for the first time? And how did it come to you? Did it come very slowly? Did it grow over years? Or was it an Eureka moment and you ran through town like Archimedes did at his time? Over the last 20 years, I changed my mind, step by step. And I came to the conviction that our collective next 20 years have to be about a disruption, about a good disruption from an economic system that destroys natural systems to one where natural systems thrive. It's over 20 years ago that I left business school. Um, it was quite a change for me when I arrived because I had been working at a geologist before uh, in a world of very complex geological systems. And all of a sudden I was in a world where everything that was outside the model was called a non-linearity. Well, my professional life the last 20 years I very much spent in a world of non-linearities, of very complex systems. A lot is happening in 20 years. Um, this is Fidelis. She is the secret CEO of our family. She's turning 20 today. Many of those 20 years I spent in one of the world's leading consultancies, uh, helping companies to become more efficient. And I enjoyed it to the utmost. Uh, I enjoyed the firm. I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the freedom that I got to build the global sustainability practice of McKinsey. But it also opened my eyes and it started to form a view that the economy can work differently. No, it must work differently, according to an utterly different paradigm. Who of you has read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of a Scientific Revolution? He was the first one to talk about paradigm shift. We do have uh, explanatory models that help us to understand our reality. And then all of a sudden we are making observations that don't seem to be congruent to that model, to that paradigm. And so we call it an an anomaly. And then there are more of those anomalies and all of a sudden the paradigm is getting into crisis. We are finding a new paradigm and the old one dies. I think the point I, was, I want to make today is that we need to find a new paradigm in the way we think about economic growth. All the way towards the mid-80s, <coughs> all the major lead indicators of the economy were developing in sync. And since then, we are seeing a major divergence, a great divergence. And that is starting to hit our life today. Two of the dynamic gaps on this chart are, in fact, <coughs> doing that. The one is the difference between labor productivity and median family income. And it could be that the eruptive power of some of the political changes that we have seen over the last two, day, two years have, in fact, to do with that. And the second dynamic gap is that between GDP growth and any reasonable measure of society's progress, like the genuine progress indicators, which is stagnating or it's even declining. And that has to do with the massive costs of growth. We are growing poor. And that's different. When externalities get bigger than the benefits, that is a new paradigm. That is a rab rabbit and no more a duck. So let's talk about growth. We can't talk about growth without celebrating it. Within the 20th century, our global GDP grew from 1.2 trillion to 47 trillion, 40 times. And even in the last 20 years, it tripled. It took a billion people out of poverty. And today we are commanding materials and goods and possibilities that even emperors could only dream of 100 years ago. Not to celebrate that would be cynical at best. But particularly because Growth is so important, we need to understand what are the deeper drivers. That takes us into the territory of growth theory, or better, neoclassical growth here. Robert Solo, he taught us it's all about capital accumulation and labor. However, it's only describing 30 to 50 percent of growth, and the rest we very politely called the Solo residual. Very few theories get away with that, by the way. There's a new generation of economists which is asking themselves what <coughs> could be alternative explanations. 
Exegy, that's their answer. They said that is natural resources put to work, put to useful work. In other words, we have over the last 200 years, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, just put uh, many natural resources and energy to work on our economy, a resource bonanza. And that sounds very intuitive in a way. And that's very important to know at a moment where we want to have more growth, because we are growing less, <coughs> less. Decade after decade, over the last years, we have seen less growth in OECD's economies. And if we want to accelerate growth, and if we do that with the old natural resource intensive way of growing, there is a risk that we are running almost a combustion engine hotter and hotter, and that we are countering the positive benefits of growth, and that we are growing poor. And that's exactly what we see. Whilst we have 2% of growth, <coughs> Uh, over the last 20 decades, if you go with a more modern definition of what wealth really could be, which is the sum of the wealth that we have in terms of social capital, natural capital, and manufactured capital, then in fact we have been declining 0.2% every year. So that is the massive cost that's accounted for in those numbers that comes with climate change, that comes with uh, water scarcity, with ocean pollution, uh, or the loss of biodiversity. We have 60 years of topsoil left. Now, what's the way out of that? Let me start with what is not the way out of it. We won't grow ourselves green. At least we won't grow ourselves green automatically. The shorthand for that discussion is the Kutnetz curve and the observation that as we grow richer, our resource intensity actually decreases. But you can see it immediately. It's visually evident that the peak is just far too high, and this is plastic. We could have shown it for cement, for aluminium, for power. The peak is by far too high, it comes by far too late, it's by far too flat post-peak, and that there are by far too many large economies on this side of the curve. So that can't be the answer. What could be the answer? Here could be an, the architecture of an answer, and one of the pillars on the left-hand side should, in fact, fill us with confidence. It's abundant clean energy. And who would have thought five to ten years ago that this, for the first time, is a thinkable future, that we do have a defossilized energy sector? For the first time, it's not close, let's face it, but it's thinkable that by mid-century we will have a defossilized energy sector. But that's not good enough. On the right-hand side, we need, in the same way as we are defossilizing our energy sector, we need to dematerialize or decouple our industrial sector. And we have to make all the natural resources we are taking to use an asset and a material backbone and to use it over and over again. But even that is not good enough. Out of those, we need to build the new systems, the high-performing economic system, mobility system, food system, housing systems, that create prosperity. And only if we see that those systems generate prosperity, we will, have, we will change our norm. We will see the rabbit over the duck, and we will, will believe that there is something like decoupled growth and that there is something like a net positive system. Is this a dream, or is this a political reality, a political option? Uh, two years ago, the European Union asked exactly that question, and we had the chance, a friend of mine, Ellen MacArthur, a world record yachtswoman, who started the Ellen Ar MacArthur Foundation, and myself, to put a lock in the fire in front of the European Commission. And we didn't start to talk about the environment, and we didn't start to talk about resource dependency, and we could, because Europe is hugely resource dependent, 760 billion of resource imports every year. We talked about the economic opportunity and we talked about the structural waste which is sitting in our system which we could relieve. <laughs> and we have taken the three most efficient and mature systems of the European economy, the mobili mo mobility system, the food system and the housing system. And let's just see what it, <coughs> what it does. The mobility system, whilst cars are so efficient that we have to start cheating as we all know, uh, the system is full of inefficiencies. A car is parked 92% of its time. Out of five seats, only 1.2 or 1.5 are typically used. Out of 
the energy that we put into a car, only 20% uh, actually makes it to the wheel, and only a thirteenth of that is used to transport us. 50% of our cities is used for traffic space, although even during rush hour, only 10% of that is covered. Or let's look at the food system. Only 5% of the nutrients that we apply to the field are actually making it into the human body. Not always to our best health, by the way. And go for the housing system, where even on a Tuesday morning, only 40% uh, utilization is marked. So, if you look at it all together, a European good only has a lifetime of typically nine years. At, at the end of those nine years, only 5% of the energy or material value that sits in it is actually recovered. And we started to accept that. It's a social norm. That's the duck. During those nine years of lifespan, only 50% is utilized for the reason that I just that I just spoke about. So by all intents and purposes, even in Europe and even in a very efficient economy, we are still very resource intensive and very inefficient when it comes on a system level. The second point that we made is technology can change that because we have it at our fingertips. The iPhone, the smartphone allows us to share. Um, the massive cost degradation that we have seen in renewable energies allows us to build distributed generation. Or the Internet of Things is allowing us to track materials and put them back to use. Exponential technology. We've seen how technology is disru can disrupt information sectors such as uh, banking, such as retail, such as uh, uh, the media sector. For the first time now, it's hitting the physical sectors. And we ask ourselves, what could technology actually do to transform these sectors? A mobility system, which for a first time is autonomous, it's shared, it's connected, it's electrified, and it's designed uh, for reuse. And the answer is, by 2050, we could in fact have the same service for only 20% of the cost. Not less resources, but less cost for the user. This is a major wage increase to the European family, similar for food, the build environment, or the build environment. Um, and many of those levers, regenerate, share, optimize, loop, virtualize, exchange, those levers that actually massively decouple us from resource use are in fact in the money. And some of those businesses are, that are taking advantage of those drivers are amongst the fastest growing that at least I am aware of. The third point we made is technology doesn't take us there alone. Uh, we do know historically that on the one hand, there are rebounds effect. It's getting cheaper and we use more of it. And secondly, we do know that system innovation travels much more slowly than product innovation. And there is a risk that we are introducing those technologies into the old system in a way that does not address the, stress, the structural waste that's built into the system. So we need to look for principles. And the circular economy, the circular regenerative economy, is providing some of those principles. It's an economy that does not know waste. Waste is food. And it's one where finite resources are, in fact, controlled, principle number one. It's one where all the resources that we are taking into use are maximized in their use, principle number two, and where we are avoiding negative spillovers into other systems altogether, principle number three. And we do that by taking all durables in a cycle to make sure they can be used over and over again, like my watch. Or on the consumable side, we are designing them in such a way that they can safely re-enter the biosphere, like my shirt. The fourth point that we made is that this is an economy where, which, provides, or that <coughs> which provides very good instructions for how to build future systems. And so we modeled them very concretely with 200 engineers. Um, we tried to find out what would this mobility system, the housing system, the food system look like. And not only is it providing the services much cheaper to the European family, it also and brings our resource requirements massively down, as you would expect, and it also allows us to stay within the two degrees centigrade corridor that we committed to in Paris. But more than that, when we modeled the results, we also <coughs> find strong indications that this will be a driver of growth across Europe. Uh, we think that until 2030 there will be an extra 7% of growth. That's half a percentage point a year. That doesn't sound a lot, but just think back. 30 years ago when Europe created the internal market, that was, and thank God it did, that was against the promise of half a percentage point extra growth. 
So you could look at this circular regenerative economy for Europe as a project, a political and economic project of the same order of magnitude. And that's why politicians like it. Uh, Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, China are starting to adopt it. Uh, Yuri Katain, the vice president of the European Commission, says that the circular economy is a mega trend just as globalization. And business leader, leaders like it because they see that this is an economy, the circular economy, that will outgrow global GDP that you want to be invested into. Uh, and still, we are not investing ourselves into the circular economy. Uh, capital flows are far too, too slow, we are losing the race, and we are continuing to be into a spiral of natural capital degradation. We are long on the linear economy and we are short on the circular economy. One linear economy which is very epic is that of plastic and plastic packaging. Globally, we are producing 300 million tons. Anything between 8 and 12 million are entering the ocean today. My team has calculated that in 2022 there will be 3 kilograms of fish to 1 kilogram of plastic. In 2042, it's 1 kilogram of plastic to 1 kilogram of fish. That's a future that no one can want. And it comes with massive costs to communities, to ecosystems, and also to the brand owners that are operating in the the chain. And that's at, the, at a moment where we do know the answers. It's decoupling ourselves from virgin feedstock. It's about designing for reusability, recyclability, or biodegradation. And it's about setting up the system that stop it from leaking into the environment. So why doesn't it happen? Over 20 years of McKinsey, I came to the conclusion that this is not technology innovation, this is system innovation. We are dealing with a challenge of systemic change. And that was the reason why two years ago we started Systemic. Jeremy Oppenheim, another senior partner from McKinsey and myself. And we are deploying our fantastic team of 80 people and our capital to incubate, to enable, to cultivate and to scale the solutions, these new economic systems that are currently underinvested. We want to make them investable. Uh, we are doing that for land use systems, for new urban, sustainable urban systems, we do it for new energy systems, and we do it for circular industrial systems. Well, two years is too early to tell, but as things are going, we might have a case. And our case is very simple. We have, over the last 200 years, built a global economy of 75 trillion. With 3.5% growth over the next 20 years, we are going to build a second economy just the same size. Doing it in the same way we built the first economy, with the same amount of resource intensity, with the same amount of <coughs> degradation for social and natural capital, we will be off the charts. It's just not an option. Being just a little bit more efficient and being just a little bit more sustainable cannot be the answer. We need to transform the existing economy and we need to rethink and reinvent the new economy that we are building. And that is something that needs to happen, but currently it's frankly just unthinkable. So it's time to change our mind. It's time <coughs> to move from management to leadership it's time to move from optimizing existing systems towards rethinking new systems. So who is there who could heal that? I think it's the generation of the 20-year-olds, and that's you and Fidel. Thank you.